don't trip over that thing and hurt the other side. <laughs> Well, good morning again. Good morning. good morning. Exciting to be in the house of the Lord, especially with you. This morning is, uh, the message is entitled Integrity. We can certainly think of all sorts of things that that requires and that defines. And so this morning we're going to take a look at our passage and uh, find out exactly how Paul explained it to the Christians in Ephesus. It's the fourth chapter of the first 16 verses. I'm going to turn this way. I can see better. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascend mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the faithfulness of Christ. And then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. From Him, the whole body, joined and held together in every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. It is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Yeah. Have you ever noticed how God has this knack of pulling what's going on in our life, in our congregation, in our daily walk, and bringing it in on Sunday morning in, in scripture and in study and in and in message, and how important it is for us to not just listen to the words, but to hear the message that God brings to us. And so I'm going to do my best this morning to talk a little bit about integrity. It is the uh, word that comes to us out of the, the Apostle Paul's own language, and it helps us to understand more and more the relationship God wants with us and with each other. So Paul discusses what constitutes serving God with integrity. And the question that comes to, to my mind is, if this is what Paul gets from God to give to the people of Ephesus in those times, what is the, the, the part of integrity that allows us to be a faith community? that operates with integrity. And he pulls, points it out, doesn't he? One body, one spirit. And he writes uh, to those in Ephesus, just as you were called to one hope, your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father above all, through all, and in all. That is so encompassing of all things that we understand. It's all about oneness, isn't it? Seven times in those three verses we talk about one. 
one body, spirit, hope, Lord, faith, baptism, God. It's the heart of what integrity is all about. Oneness. It means that you are whole, that you are complete, that you are undivided in your one set of values as being a Christian, a, a follower of, of Christ. And for us as a church community, integrity is not going to show if we show love in one situation and hatred in another. Because you see, people really did prefer to come to a faith community that has this high place in their worship and in their in their actions of integrity. Now, of course, everybody that goes to church loves things like good music, good preaching, Bible study, small groups. And the message, uh, if we were to put on our sign out front, we are a church of, of great integrity. Do you think that would make people rush into our doors? I don't think so, because... It's not about words as much as it is actions. Would you buy a car from somebody that has on their sign or their name Honest Bob Used Cars? And I'm thinking that may be a little misleading. Because you see, integrity requires works and deeds, not words. So I found this uh, in my research for this week. I found this statement. Now, I'm not advertising for this restaurant, but I want to tell you a little bit about Chipotle as a uh, restaurant of uh, integrity. You see, they pull pork off of their menu. Now, you might know, either by eating there or understanding the name, it's probably uh, one of Mexican food. And to pull pork out of their menu is a serious thing. But you see, Chipotle promises to serve food with integrity. That's part of their mission statement. It means that if the suppliers that give them the food do not um, stand up to the same quality and the ethic standards that they, that they believe in, they will not buy their products. Such happened with the pigs that, they were, that, they were, that were being raised for Chipotle restaurants. And uh, the spokesman said, there was a decision rooted in our unwillingness to compromise our standards. How important that is for all of us, but especially for a restaurant. In the highly competitive fast food businesses, you have to respect a company that will not compromise its standards to make a buck. Pulling pork from their menu was a very big deal. So if you ask the CEO, his name was Steve Ellis, the CEO of Chipotle, that if having in their mission statement food with integrity, if he thinks that attracts customers, and he says he doesn't think anybody comes to a restaurant because they serve food with integrity. He doesn't have anyone that has come to his restaurants and says, I want food with integrity and I want to eat that right now. What they're looking for is food that tastes good. And he said, if you were to come into our restaurant, walk into the refrigerator areas, and you would see nothing but fresh food, fresh vegetables, fresh meats. We, do, we cook our food. We don't prepare food for your plate. The motto, food with integrity, is just not enough. Deeds are what make the difference. So let's talk about how does the church act, our church, the church in general. What sorts of deeds are involved in being a church with integrity? Well, Paul suggested it to the Ephesians, and he might as well have said it to us personally. With all hum humility, gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in a bond of peace. And if we perform these actions and also practice speaking truth and love, we will grow up, we will mature in our, in our Christian walk. It's like joining together, knitting together every ligament with which we are equipped so that our body works as it is intended and grows up into love. 
So notice this vision of integrity, the body of Christ joined together, knit together as each part then works properly. That's Paul's vision of the church, of this community with a physical presence of Jesus in the world today. It's how we share love as a faith community. And Paul wants the church, the, the church general, the church universal, to be a church with integrity, one that is whole and complete and undivided. Our work begins with that humility and gentleness. These are counter-cultural virtues in a world that seems to be to reward aggressive self-promotion of people bragging about themselves on Facebook and Twitter. I found an example of a pastor who said uh, he had gone to a conference in, in California and he was in Oregon and he, he put on uh, the internet. So I went to this conference, got out late Saturday night, drove all night long, walked into the church, changed clothes, taught Sunday school, preached all with passion and clarity. Why do you think he had to do that? Does that show any sense of integrity? What that shows is a self-interest in what can I do? How can we do with God's help? As a church with integrity, we have leaders, apostles, prophets, evangelists, Paul speaks of Christ giving gifts to individuals so that all of these functions can be performed. Um, I just had this thought. I've been often told that uh, the sermons that I give, that every pastor gives, are more for themselves than they are for the other ones. That we need to rely on those around us with the gifts that they've been given. So um, here's another example of integrity. So if you were a government employee and you know that the, the government's about to build a, uh, a big complex on this property just outside of town, they're going to put in an airport and a shopping plaza, and you have a friend who owns property in that area, should you tell them in advance that that property may be valued much higher in the future? Should you even go out and see if you could buy property with your advanced notice? We're talking integrity here. You're struggling to pass this test in your graduate exam. You've studied like crazy for it, but you're still not confident that you can answer all the questions the way that they're intended. But your friend took the test this morning and offered to give you the answers to all the questions that were asked. Do you ask him for those answers? Your ex-girlfriend comes into town, just wants to have a casual lunch. Do you tell your wife? What would you do in situations like the ones that we've just talked about? How long would it take you to, to decide which way you would respond? Real situations, real dilemmas. What is it that we do when we're faced with questions like that? And the next thing we need to explore in the topic of integrity is patience. It's another virtue. Sometimes it seems terribly short in days like the days we're experiencing. The entire fast food industry is rounded on our desire to have hot food delivered to us now. I want mine and I want it now. We want what we want, when we want. You could even go get your oil changed at Jiffy Lube. We're not talking about price here. We're talking about convenience. We're talking about get it done. We're getting it done, getting it done now. But God's work takes time. It takes patience. It takes perseverance. Paul tells us and tells the, the Christians at Ephesus, that they're coming to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. They're coming to maturity is what we're saying. We're coming to, to Christian maturity to measure that whole state of Christ within us. Unity, knowledge, maturity, all of these things take time. 
Use patience. What I've learned in the past is don't ask God to give you patience. There are, all, there are many ways that you can learn patience. None of them are kind or easy. I found something where Paul Harvey told the story about uh, four young students who were late in class and they went to the teacher as they walked in the door. We're so sorry we're late. Um, we had a flat tire in the car. And the teacher said, well, I'm sorry you're late because we had a, a pop quiz. And she said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you, the, I'll give you an exam and uh, I need for each of you to take this piece of paper and I want you to go to the four corners of the room. And then she said, so this is the only question on your exam. If you get it right, you will pass with an A+. Plus. Which tire? Yeah. <laughs> Character. It takes care of to build integrity. There's a Jewish story about a man who visited the angel of death. And the angel of death said to him, in just a few days, you're going to die. And the man begged with the angel, he said, what will they ask me when I appear at the gates of heaven? And he said, it's not for me to answer your question of what will they ask, but I can tell you what they will not ask. They will not ask, why were you not more like your neighbor? The rabbi that told this story tells it to illustrate how important it is in life that we strive to be our authentic selves. Happiness is when what you think and what you say and what you do are all, are all in, in harmony. I was going to put a clip up of a movie with Jim Carrey, the Liar Liar. I think many of us have seen that. It's a quite, a, quite an older movie. And I thought that will be a good example. I can just put it up, kind of like our Jaws music last week. Except I couldn't find a clean portion of the clip to put up there. But just as a synopsis of that movie, the, the son makes a wish on his birthday before he blows out the case. Lord, let my dad, just even for one day, tell the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. So the rest of the movie, Jim Carrey's character is beaten and slapped, humiliated by friends and foes because he is being honest. Brutal brutally honest, if you can remember some of the scenes that I couldn't play. <laughs> honesty is an excellent virtue, but honesty alone can be brutal. Maybe that's why the Bible often re recommends that virtue come in pairs. Only one virtue is necessary to moderate and enhance another. The Apostle Paul tells us, how about trying true with love? Finally, we're to bear with one another in love, making every effort to maintain this unity of the Spirit, this bond of, of peace. Whether we're talking of things like women in ministry or praise music and worship, or where to make cuts in the budget so that the church will be okay financially. There are going to be Christians of good faith on both sides of all of those questions when we are faced with contentious issues. Paul instructs us not to attack each other, not to undermine each other, not to try to gain victory over one another, but to bear with one another in love. A church with integrity does this because you see there's nothing more important than a church that is knit together, an undivided body in, of Christ in the world. 
And that's what people are drawn to when they're looking for a, a church. We cannot share the good news of Jesus Christ if we're putting all of our energy in battling between each other. Of course, important issues cannot be ignored. So Paul recommends the practice of speak, speaking truth in, in love. This means that if we speak the truth that has been revealed to us by God, but we do it in love without belittling or beating up on other people who disagree with us, the success will come from staying focused on core values, no matter what the challenges that arise are. So, Paul summed it up like this. A church that remains committed to humility and gentleness, practice of uh, patience, bearing with one another, and speaking truth and love, that's a church that can maintain unity of the Spirit and oneness in Christ. And that's what we all call a church with integrity. I hope you can just... Amen. Amen.
When I think of communion, it has so many meanings in my mind, maybe less in my heart. But communion to me brings together all of us. Maybe that's part of the definition of that word. But it also reminds us of the thing that we do to remember. It reminds us of the Lord's Supper where they gathered in the upper room and they, where Christ made that final commitment to follow through in all that he was to do in his earthly mission. And maybe that's all part of it. Maybe that's part of integrity as well. But twice a month, we pause to remember the gift that Christ gave to us, that sacrifice that Christ gave to us, the, really the answer to hope, the answer to the promise that God gave to all of us. And so, we remember by sharing in the Lord's Supper. It's an opportunity for us to remember what Christ did for us. And so we take a, a grape that symbolizes the chalice. A little square of nine bread symbolizes the loaf that he broke and he said on that faithful night, my blood, my body, shed and broken for you. So as you take this and we share together, we are symbolic, symbolically recreating in our hearts the answer to promise, sacrifice, certainly in our salvation. It is the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ broken for the sins of the world. And then Jesus said, take this. Eat and drink all of it. In remembrance. It is the body and blood of our Lord and Savior. And all the children say. Amen. Amen.
invite to stand up. We're going to sing completely overwhelmed.